Okay. Hi, Dr. Okison, are you there? Yes, I'm here. You can hear, can me? hear me? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Great. We'll, we'll get started in just a minute. Sounds good. And let's see. Corey, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Great. Wonderful. Thanks, Corey. Um, how about Kata? Are you there? Try again. Let's see. Kata, are you there? I'm here. Hello. This Great. So glad. Okay, we'll get started in just a minute. We're gathering folks um, on the line. So. Dr. Abbott, are you there? Maybe not yet. It's okay. Hello? Hello. Hello. This is the Hi. National Academy staff. We're just about to get started. Okay, great. This is Jeremy Abbott. Oh, great. Hi, Dr. Abbott. Thank you. This is Margaret. Okay. Um, oh, great. Hi, Margaret. Thank you so much. Hi, this is Dr. Kevin Huff. Oh, great. Hi, Dr. Huff. Thanks for joining. I'm actually going to be stepping away for a little bit during this to finish a procedure and then I'll be <laughs> okay no problem thank you um, thanks everyone for taking time out of your uh, schedules uh, to speak with us today this is Rebecca English um, and Kathy Liverman as uh, co-directors of the study um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kata Bond our committee chair to introduce the webinar Hello, everyone. As chair of the National Academies Committee on Temporal Mandibular Disorders, I would like to welcome everyone to this public information gathering session. <clears throat> this session is meant to inform the work of the committee, and it's open, on-the-record information gathering session. The <clears throat> webinar is being recorded, and the recorded will be posted on the project website. No formal report of this webinar will be prepared. As part of the National Academy's process, the committee collects information and materials to consider and discuss as it makes its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. So I'm asking everybody to be mindful that the committee has made no conclusions yet, and so it would be a mistake for everyone to leave here thinking otherwise. Commit comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, shouldn't be interpreted as positions of the committee or the National Academies until our report comes out. In addition, committee members may ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. Uh, as this is an information gathering activities of the committee, only the members of the committee can ask questions to speakers but written comments are always accepted by emailing tmdstudy at nasedu. Part of the study statement of tasks charges the committee to identify barriers to appropriate patient-centered TMD care in the presence and absence of an evidence base and strategies to reduce these barriers along the continuum of TMD pain. This morning, the committee has invited five dental care providers 
to explore the current state of TMD patient care, incentives and barriers to producing evidence-based TMD care, and the unique challenges and opportunities in conducting dental practice research to better understand TMD. Today's discussion supplements other information gathering activities, including panel discussions at the committee's March workshop, which is also available on the project website, the committee's ongoing analysis of the literature, and committee members' own experience in this area, among others. As all information presented to the committee, the viewpoints expressed in the webinar should not be in misinterpreted as those of individual members of the committee or the committees <laughs> as a whole. I would like to introduce committee member, Dr. Corey Resnick, who is Assistant Professor of Oral and Maxillofacial <laughs> Surgery at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Dr. Resnick also practices pediatric oral and maxillofacial surgery at Boston's Children's Hospital. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Resnick to introduce the speakers and moderate the discussion with the committee. And again, welcome you all to this webinar. Corey? Uh, thank you very much, Kata. So the format for this webinar, as you've seen, is for two speaker panels. Uh, each speaker has five to eight minutes for the formal remarks, and I hope that we can try to keep to that time so we can uh, have everyone weigh in and end on time. Uh, after each speaker, we'll pause for clarifying questions before we move on to the next speaker. And after the first three speakers, which are the first panel, then we'll take a longer pause and we can have more discussion with the committee. The uh, panel two speakers, which are Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Huff, uh, can feel free to join in the discussion in panel one. The only reason that we're separating this into two panels is just to break up the formal remarks with discussion, but it's not meant to exclude any of the speakers from participating in our discussion. So we'll get right into it. Our first speaker, we're very lucky to have Dr. Jeff Okeson, who's an orofacial pain and TMD expert. Uh, Dr. Okeson is the founder and director of the Orofacial Pain Center at the University of Kentucky. He's recognized worldwide as an authority in the field of TMD and orofacial pain, <clears throat> called by his peers as the world ambassador for orofacial pain. He's published two textbooks and more than 240 publications in peer reviewed journals. And as I said, he's the director of the Orofacial Pain Center at the University of Kentucky, which he founded in 1977. So uh, take it away, Dr. Okeson. Thank you very much, Corey. Appreciate that invitation. I appreciate the invitation to talk to the committee about some things that, that I've been trying to work on for many years. Do you have my slides up there right now? Is it, are we, are we on? Your slides at the moment. Uh, hold on. Kendall's got them. Here we go. Okay, we got them now? Your slides are up. All righty, thank you. Uh, so once again, thank you. I, 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 you know, since I don't know the audience, it's hard sometimes to focus exactly on what we should say. I know you got lots of questions, so I'm gonna try to take it from where I am from an academic standpoint, I guess. I think some important things about some statistics about TM disorder is an interesting paper that was written by Horst, where they surveyed a, a, over a thousand dental practices in, in the North Pacific and asked the press questions to patients, why did you come to your clinic? And one out of six patients were there because of pain. And we start looking at pain, dental pain, of course, was the most common toothache, which we manage in dentistry very nicely. But the second most common complaint that our pa the patients had were musculoskeletal, which is exactly what we're talking about here, temporal medibular disorder. So it's a, it's a big problem. 10 to 20% of the general population have TM disorder symptoms at some time, and 7% are seeking care. So it's a problem that we need to be addressing. So I'm gonna give you a little definition here, and I'm sorry if this is too simple, but what is TMD? It's a collective term embracing a number of clinical problems that involve the masculine musculature, the temporal medibular joint, and associated structures, or both. So what we're talking about here basically are musculoskeletal pains that have their origin in the masculine structures. So, the, so that's the general kind of umbrella term. However, we've got these terms that are being used like TMJ, that TMJ patient, whatever. And I think that's a description that's going to be a problem if we're going to advance this, because that suggests to me, if I have a, if I have a doctor call me and say, Jeff, I got a TMJ patient, I want to ask you about it. I really can't help them very much because it's sort of the same. They're all the same. They're not all the same. If, if, when I take a look at pain disorders, this is the classification that I will put people into. So we have groups of muscle pain, which is actually more predominant than the joint pain. So to call these patients TMJ patients, I think is slanting 
a direction towards the joint, which may not be guilty of producing the pain. There's inflammatory pains, chronic mandibular hypomobilities, growth disorders. All of these are team disorders. And the key to understanding this is if you want to be successful, we got to know which one it is because they require different types of treatments. That makes this area a little bit broader than, than we'd like, I guess. But to make it even more challenging to us is that TM disorders is only one subcategory of orofacial pain. The big broad categories of what people have faced pain, and, and if somebody asked me for a categories of orofacial pain, I'd show this because this is the kinds of conditions, all these conditions are producing pain in the face. Patients walk into an office, dental office, physician's office, holding their face, and we've got to make a decision where they fit. TM disorders are down here. These are musculoskeletal pain conditions, and dentists should be able to manage these because that's what this is. These are sort of isolated to, to dentists. But there's a lot of other reasons in migraine and sinus infection and neuropathic pain, which we get confused, which means the subject is a complicated one. And so I would list it this way, that TMD is a problem for dentists, but it's not always a dental problem which is something that we as a profession have to grasp because if a person has a TM disorder, don't go to an orthopedist, don't go to an otolaryngologist, don't go to a neurologist, come to a dentist because a dentist is supposed to have the understanding of how the jaw system works. And that's what TMD is about. It's musculoskeletal pain of, of the masculatory system. Now, the problem we faced in the past is we focused on one area of this, which is the occlusion. And we, we know occlusion, dentists know occlusion. But we start looking at this whole broad area, we start to understand, we need to see what's, to be successful in managing these patients, we need to understand etiology. So we go back and say, well, what causes these musculoskeletal conditions? And if you follow the opera studies, you, you'd see there's some very broad, broad statements there about etiological factors. I look at it this way. Most of us have a normal functioning, have a normal functioning masturbatory system. So we had breakfast this morning, no pain to chew. And some of us developed this thing we call TM disorders. So our question is, what got us from this point to this point? What etiological factors? And one of the etiological factors that we have dwelled on, I guess, in dentistry is the thing we know best, occlusion, bites. And then something interesting has evolved, which is the evidence-based dentistry. And we start looking at this as do we have strong evidence that way. And when you start looking at evidence, we start to appreciate this is a bigger, broader field. We've got adaptability of the patients. We've got other etiological factors, such as trauma, emotional stress, deep pain, parafunction, which really, which is really challenging to us because what we know as dentists is occlusion. And if you start treating these patients as if occlusion is the biggest factor, that may not be the biggest factor. There may be a whole lot of other issues. So it, it lays out a foundation that makes this area a little more complicated to manage, but one that we need to be able to manage. Because we need we dentists need to understand TM disorders and be able to differentiate TM disorders from other oral facial pain conditions. So if somebody said, well, who's the gatekeeper? Who should be the gatekeeper when it comes to TM disorders? I think it needs to be the dentist. Because the dentist should ha understand how this jaw system works and be able to separate those patients who truly have TMD from those patients who don't have TMD. They've got pain in the face, but it's something else, whether that's migraine, whether that's a sinus infection, whether it's neuropathic, neuro, trigeminal neuralgia, whatever. And the separation has to be there because then there's differences between treating, the dentist can either treat or refer, both of which are good therapies for the patient upon, upon making that decision. So now the question becomes, we've got the dentist. If it is TMD, then the dentist should be in a, in a position to prepare to do some nice things for the patient, offer education to the problem, explain the natural course of this disorder, things that the patient could do for themselves, some advice, some really simple reversible types of therapy. Those things can be very useful in, in many patients with TM disorders. And perhaps even in, when indicated, make an occlusal appliance. I mean, that's something that we professionally have done as, as almost a knee-jerk reaction. However, it's not always indicated for all patients, but if it is, we have those options. Because what we've learned is that most of the acute TMDs are managed by real conservative reversible therapies. Now, there are some patients with chronic TMDs, and this is more complicated. And I think these patients may be best offered to send to some of the oral facial pain specials. We now have about 12 programs approved by the Commission Dental Accreditation, where we're educating dentists to at least two years full-time, just studying pain. And I think this is a really good thing for patients, good thing for our profession. These are individuals who can manage the more complicated, multi-professional types of therapy that I'm sure we'll be talking about. 
Now, so how well are dentists trained? Here's the question that comes to my mind because I've been in dental education for a number of years now. What's our history? Did we teach this question in dental schools? Well, actually in 1991, we had the first educational conference on TM disorders, developing curriculum. That's 28 years ago. We came up with some, some conclusions and recommendations. We sent those to what was then the American Association of Dental Schools, and they accepted those, but didn't make any changes in the curriculum. So the next year, we had a second educational conference, and we also made recommendations to the American Association of Dental Schools. They made no changes at that time. Then some eight years later, we had the third edu educational conference and on TM disorders. And we made recommendations not only to Adita, where they changed their name to the American Dental Education Association, and onto the Commission on Dental Accreditation, but interesting enough, no changes were made. Now, we've, in, 19, in 2007, we have a survey of the American dental, uh, dental Schools to see what was being taught in the area of TM disorders. And what we learned was that pre-doctoral teaching of TMD has progressed some. However, many schools do not address these topics adequately while other schools use outdated concepts. And so their conclusions were that we need standards needed to assure that all pre-doctoral dental students learn about the diagnosis and treatment of, the diagnosis and treatment of non-dental non orofacial non pain. If this is the second most common pain complaint that we, that we see, we've gotta be able to understand that to help our patients. So from a committee standpoint, if I had any suggestions to make to the committee, I'd say, I would encourage the committee, I would, the, I'd ask the, the committee to encourage the American Dental so Education Society, as well as the Commission Dental Accreditation, to, to require TMD be included in all dental school curriculums. I, I've, I've been teaching now a long time, 45 years. I've witnessed about seven different type, seven different uh, uh, CODA, you know, Commission Dental Accreditation, reaccreditation, and nobody has come to me and said, what do you teach? That's a shame because it's the second most common pain complaint our dentists are gonna to have to face and we don't have any requirements to teach that. I think we need to work on that. We need to promote an interaction between dentists and physicians and encourage the, re, the, the, re, the work together on this area because this is a, this thing called pain crosses all the boundaries. And the physicians need to know what dentists can offer and dentists need to know what physicians can offer and work on it as a multi-professional team. And I'm sure we'll have some questions about that one as well as encourage insurance companies to improve reimbursement for the management of TMD. It's interesting to note that the temporary mandibular joint, I think is the only joint in the body that is restricted from insurance companies. We don't cover that joint, which is an interesting thing. Part of that is education. We'll have, we can have some discussions about that also, but we need to have that there so patients can get their help from insurance companies and, and providers can have practices where they treat some of these TMD problems. So I'm sorry that was in such a hurry, but I wanted to get that off in the minutes like that. So I'm back to the questions when the time comes. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Okeson. Uh, does anyone have any initial questions uh, for Dr. Okeson, keeping in mind that we'll have a little more time uh, after the other two uh, first panel speakers to discuss this more? Yes, this is Francesca. I have one question. Go ahead. Can you hear? Okay. Dr. Okerson, you mentioned that there were 12 um, orofacial um, surgery centers that um, the patients with more chronic diseases could be referred to. Uh, my question is, do you think that's enough access for all the patients who will need care? Okay. Uh, is it, yes, we have 12 programs. We have, we have, we have guidelines from the Commission of Accreditation to establish specialty training, if you will, in oral facial pain. 12 are here. Is that enough? No, it's not nearly enough if you take a look at the number of patients that have TM disorders. But it's the beginning of developing the individuals in dentistry who can go out there and specialize more in the chronic oral facial pains with multi-professional types of approaches. I think every dentist needs to have basic understanding. And if we get base dental, every dentist have a basic understanding, a lot of the acute conditions could be mon managed way before they move into the chronicity, because those are two different kinds of patients. So I'd say it works. We should get some relief if we get dentists to know how to do things in a more appropriate, conservative way, but we still need more educational program. We're going to be going about eight years now, um, and, and we're seeing more and more programs develop. So that'd be the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have a question for Dr. Okasen for now? Um, 
this is Corey Resnick. Uh, just a quick question for you, Dr. Oakson. Sure. You know, it, we keep coming around to this cycle of uh, having uh, not enough education at the dentist's training level on temporal vibrio disorders, and then um, not having enough providers to provide good TMD care. Uh, do we have, if, if there was a mandate that dental schools had to teach a certain curriculum of TMD care, do we have the faculty to teach that? And if not, how do we develop that faculty? Yeah, I, that's a very excellent point, Corey, because if, if, it, if they said tomorrow we have to have this, there'd be dental, some dental schools who don't have well-trained individuals to teach that. So it's got to be a progression of events, you know, that, that require at least some recognition of this field. So some people can do it. And the, the, the thing is, we don't have our educational programs. So we have 12 programs right now. They're going to graduate maybe 20 individuals each year, combination of all the programs or something like that, maybe a little bit more. Um, those individuals, a lot of the ones that I'm training are going into education and that would help us because some of those would go to dental schools that don't have this. We've got to be encouraged our deans to be able to set enough precedents that people need to understand this, that they start acquiring individuals who have some of the backgrounds to teach us. But you're right now, we still have a lot of dogma. We still have a lot of non-scientific types of things that are out there that we've got to be able to look at. And, and eliminate before we start to really make this a, a, a sound, proper thing for our patients. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, but of course uh, we'll have more discussion about this in just a little bit. Uh, so our second speaker is Dr. Marcella Romero Reyes, Associate Clinical Professor and Clinical Director of the Brotman Facial Pain Clinic from the Department of Neural and Pain Sciences at the University of Maryland School of Dentistry. Um, she is a nationally and internationally recognized expert in the fields of orofacial pain and headache disorders. And in addition to her dental training, she obtained a PhD in oral biology and orofacial pain and dysfunction at the UCLA School of Dentistry, uh, after which she pursued postdoctoral training in neuroscience with a focus in primary headaches. So it has a really wonderful background uh, on both temporomandibular disorders and headache disorders and surrounding pain conditions. Uh, so very interested to uh, hear your talk, Dr. Reyes. Go take it away. Hi, thank you very much. Everybody can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, so echoing what Dr. Oakes and already has said. So in the practice that I have is uh, from the Broad Facial Pain Clinic is through faculty practice. And I will say that the TMD population that I see ranges from 75 to 80% of the patients that I see of all the orofacial pain disorders. And if I, I will try to focus a little bit about management in these five to eight minutes. What I wanna say is that the first step in treating TMD should be to do a correct diagnosis. And for that, we really need education. Very unfortunate is that to have patients that come to us and they have seen for already several practitioners ranging from dentists or ENTs with not a correct diagnosis. And uh, so one of the parts is that at least we hope as an orofacial pain practitioner is to bring this awareness through the dental schools for teaching, but also I would say hopefully in, in higher uh, centers of education or associations. So in regards uh, now the management of TMD, as Dr. Okeson mentioned, first was very dentally oriented, but now we have wonderful studies and evidence-based and also from the OPERA study that has pointed out that TMD management is within a psychosocial model. So what does that mean? Well, we need to recognize the patient as a whole. It's not only teeth, it's not only occlusion. And uh, so recognize how the pain experience affects the quality of life of the patient. If the patient has depression, anxiety, a psychosocial dysfunction, uh, if the patient has a comorbid disorder, for example. So that is very important to, to, to take into account and to build our uh, management of treatment with behavioral approaches. So in regards to the natural history of TMD, I think it's very important to emphasize that really TMD, at least what the, the evidence has shown, TMD tend to get better. So studies have shown that tend to remit or improve symptomatology. And these were two studies, one for, uh, uh, from Dr. Orbach and Dr. Working, and as well as in the OPERA study that they observed this patient population from five to seven years and a half. 
So the bottom line is that TMD management should be conservative, reversible, and based in evidence-based therapeutic modalities. So with this, TMD is not managed with irreversible procedures, procedures that try to change your bite or your occlusion. And I think another speaker is going to be talking more a, a, about this. So just the irreversible procedures are not supported by evidence. And the management of TMD should be conservative, always. Or, you know, of course, it's depending on case by case. So what we do when we see the patients in our practice? So we try to design a well-defined program that is tailored for the needs of the patient based in diagnosis. It's not like a one-size-fits-all, sort of speak. So what this management uh, comprehends? So we do a self-help program. We try to empower the patient to get control of their pain. And we require patient education, for example, like Dr. Rockerson mentioned, to try to educate about the disorders and how sometimes can be waxing and waning. Uh, sometimes we can put them in a sub-diet. Sometimes we give them tools to be more aware of their habits or para functional activity. Sometimes even we teach them physical therapy modalities, for example, uh, some exercises with cold, we use a special spray to do it. Some sometimes moist heat applying the muscles, for example. In addition to that, we can use also oral appliances. We can re refer the patient to physical therapy. We can also use pharmacological agents, analgesic and say muscle relaxants. Sometimes we can do trigger point injections. Very seldom, but it's an indication, I would say, maybe for the arthritis cases. Temporomandibular joint injections may be indicated. In cases of this displacement without reduction, sometimes we can remit the patient for, to an atrocentesis. But you see, all these lists of things require a multidisciplinary approach. So the dentist training orofacial pain with a physical therapist training craniocervical therapeutics, because no, not all the PTs are trained the same. But also we need to support a psychologist. To, with a psychiatrist sometimes or a pain psychologist. And again, it's a lot of, it's a big list with a lot of things, but at least we know that can help the patient, but it's tailored for, for each specific case. And I would like also to say, so as, as was mentioned before, we have patients do tend to get better. However, we're gonna have a specific group of patients that also was reporting in the opera study that they, have, they can be refractory to regular uh, treatment. So what's very interesting that in one of the opera studies was showed that uh, in some group of this, in this group of these patients, they have an impaired catabolism of catecholamine. So they found a low activity in the COMP gene. The COMP is the catecholamine that you transferase. So there are individuals that are more susceptible to develop TMD and have exacerbation of symptoms because of this. Well, one of, one of the, it's, it's not like, oh, but it's one of the things that was found that I found it very interesting. And that these individuals present more sensitivity to pain and greater psychological distress. So now we have the opera study that keeps on going that I hope we have more uh, information regarding how to understand and manage these uh, patients that get with TND that get refractory to, to treatment. So in my opinion, what would be, what is urgently needed, I would say that the recognition uh, in dentistry that T the TMD patient sometimes will need a specialized care by trained dentists in orofacial pain disorders. And, uh, and also the, to recognize that we exist, that we are dentists trained in orofacial pain. And I think this is so important because this will enhance access to proper care for the TMD sufferer. And, uh, and as beautifully pointed out by Dr. Rockerson, the, the education for the dental students. So right now, so when, well, when I was at my time at NYU, I tried to bring that awareness with the dental students. And uh, we try to formulate uh, more hands-on as well as rotation to the orofacial pain clinic over there. So that is what I'm, what, what I'm building here in the University of Maryland. 
in addition to didactic courses, but also more exposure to cities. And I think the students really appreciate that. And they found it quite interesting and also to bring it to their environmentarian to take care better for the patients or to see when it's not dental pain and when needs to be referred. Another thing that I would like to say is that also we don't have enough providers because we lack this recognition of uh, that we, we need a specific training or a more advanced training or a partial pain. And, uh, and in regards, I would say, um, sometimes when patients come to see me, they really do say, wow, I didn't know you guys can do that, or I didn't know you guys ex exist. And as Dr. Um, Okeson mentioned, the diagnosis is TMJ, and I, we need to educate the patients that, and I joke to them, and I say, well, if you have one, you have TMJ, I have two, and you have two, too. That means the promandibular joint, and it's like you are saying you have a hip or you have a knee. So we have work to do in regards to this. So I will say I will keep it short with this comment. Thank okay. you. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Romero Reyes. Um, does anybody have any initial questions for Dr. Romero Reyes? Okay, great. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on to uh, our third speaker so that we'll have good time for discussion about uh, all three of these talks in a few minutes. Um, so our third speaker is Dr. Jeremy Abbott, an orofacial pain specialist and clinical instructor also at the University of Maryland School of Dentistry. Um, following dental school, Dr. Abbott practiced general dentistry in Oregon and Arizona prior to going back to the orofacial pain and dental medicine residency program at the University of California, Los Angeles. So uh, Dr. Abbott does have some unique experience both in the academic environment and also the private practice world. Now he lectures nationally and internationally on the management of TMJ disorders and headaches and has lots of ongoing research on TMJ disorders, headaches, and other pain conditions of the orofacial area. So uh, very interested to hear your talk, Dr. Abbott, go ahead. Uh, does everybody hear me okay, just to make sure? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so I am in private practice primarily in Bethesda, Maryland, and uh, the big thing that, you know, we see here in my private practice and, and explain our private practice, there's two uh, postgraduate trained providers that we have, uh, myself and my partner. Um, we are an in-network provider for um, for uh, major medical insurance and with Medicare. Um, we also... Um, see uh, uh, most of our, we only see oral facial pain and dental sleep medicine patients. We do not practice any general dentistry, anything like that. Um, yeah, other thing is average wait time for our, our patients is about three months. So it takes about three months for a patient, once they make an appointment to be able to be seen here in our office. Um, so the challenges that we have in private practice uh, primarily start when a uh, patient's referred to us. We have uh, multiple challenges. The initial one is when they're referred by a dentist, uh, TMB patients often enter the practice with a dental treatment proposed or attempted. So just like uh, Dr. Okeson said there, uh, and Dr. Romeas referred to is that when patients come in and they have uh, clusal adjustments, they'll have night guards, they'll have a variety of things happen. The reason. Uh, for coming in, or they may have a treatment that's already uh, started and they're in between, tr in the middle of treatment and they're sent to our office for a uh, pain referral for a, a TMJ disorder. Um, and so this uh, starts challenges in our practice because we are seeing these patients often from a dental referral after the uh, multiple things have been start it that kind of complicate the situation versus if they sent were seen in our office initially, we could have uh, addressed the issue more quickly. The other aspect we have is when we have a physician that refers to us, we're often referred for TMJ disorders, even though the, the condition can be a neuropathy, could be a neuralgia, could be a primary headache. Um, 
we're referred to as a TMJ provider, even though we have training in, in a vast variety of things. Um, the other aspects that we have in private practice as oral facial pain provider and treatment of TMJ disorders, they, the patients question why their medical insurance plan has excluded TMD for treatment. So we often have to discuss with the patients, you know, the, that the medical insurance and uh, sometimes Medicare, they do not cover uh, TMJ joint for treatment. And so these are difficulties that we do have in private practice. Um, the other things that we have in uh, private practice are challenges in reimbursement. Okay, as I see a general population, um, uh, I'm a dentist by training. I've, I've completed postgraduate residency in oral facial pain, but uh, temporomandibular joint disorders or oral facial pain doesn't fit within the practice model. Uh, Dr. Okeson has said previously, uh, I've heard him speak uh, multiple times that we're, TMD is, dentists want to do a procedure for a condition. And for temporal mandibular joint disorders, TMD does not fit that. It does not fit uh, a procedure-based practice. It fits a medical model of practice to where we see a patient for a condition, we give them medication, we give them counseling, and then we have them perform that and then come back and we reevaluate them. Maybe we're, we're going to provide a trigger point injections. We're going to provide a night guard. We're going to provide other things that will be beneficial to the patient, but it does not fit a dental practice model, even though we are dentists by training. The other aspect we have in reimbursement is that medical insurance companies and Medicare, they don't always recognize that there are trained oral facial pain providers. I have practiced oral facial pain in California and currently in Maryland. And in, in both of those locations, we had, I have, I've had difficulty with both medical insurances and Medicare. Uh, for example, in, in California, we were not, oral facial, facial pain providers were not allowed to be on the major medical insurance in California as a in-network provider. In Maryland, that is not the case. Uh, also with, Medicare in California, I could provide different procedures for patients, and I had no difficulty in in, uh, in obtaining reimbursement. But in Maryland, providing some procedures that I provided in California, they do not recognize me as a person that can provide those services, and so they have excluded me from being reimbursed for that. The next thing is that, like we said before, on multiple occasions, a significant amount of insurance plan exclude TMD. Um, in our area, the only one that really includes temporal mandibular disorders is the federal government's, any uh, plan associated with the federal government. So it, we, we definitely have difficulty in a general Still there, Dr. Abbott? Did others lose Dr. Abbott's? Uh, yeah, I did. Yes, yes, I did. Yes. yes. Dr. Abbott, can you hear us? Population. Oh, there you yeah. go. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, uh, Dr. Abbott, we lost you there for just a minute. Um, maybe we could backtrack just about uh, 20 seconds of what you were just saying. Okay. So like I said before, a significant amount of insurance plan exclude TMD. Um, the, the big concern that I have is that for the general population, they have no way to obtain uh, temporal mandibular joint care without uh, paying for it out of pocket, which can be a considerable amount. So since the insurance companies do not cover this care, um, it really results in the trained providers often opting out of insurance and Medicare. So that it's a very difficult situation for patients because they're paying out of pocket for every treatment, um, which can, it, it can add up. Um, the other, you know, where I say for suggestions that we have for improving reimbursement, looking at the, looking at, uh, as far as a patient aspect and a 
provider aspects is really educate the public that there are providers that have completed university evidence-based training. And, you know, Dr. Okeson has been a, a proponent of making sure that that's happening, but on the other aspect is there's a lot of uh, universities that aren't interested in, in, in um, obtaining those training programs. The other aspect is we need to educate medical insurance companies and Medicare that providers utilizing evidence-based care can be cost-effective and successful in treating PMD. This has been an issue where uh, non-evidence-based care was covered by medical insurance and they end up paying a significant amount. And uh, quite honestly, I can see why, because some of this care that we see as treating things evidence-based comes in and there's really no um, there's really no scientific basis for the treatment. So we really, a lot of what we see is education of, of the public and of the private insurance company and, and uh, as far as providing insurance for the patient or providing reimbursement for the patient. And that's, uh, if there's any questions, I can answer that too. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Abbott. Um, does anyone uh, from the committee or panel have any questions for Dr. Abbott? Uh, Corey, this is Kata. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Abbott, but also the other two speakers, uh, to comment on <clears throat> problems related to doing research in this area uh, at dental schools, uh, because that is certainly one of the issues the committee is thinking about. As, as far as d dental practice, which I primarily uh, uh, am in, I, I mean, the, the, the problem with uh, dental practice is always uh, finding the time. Well, like I said before, I'm three months booked out, so I have patients always wanting to come in and care. And so it's trying to find the time in private practice to, to treat the patients, to do the research uh, from that aspect. So that's what I can say with private practice as far as uh, uh, schools, I'll let the other two uh, digress on that. I'll speak to the University of Kentucky. We have uh, five, six full-time dental residents who are with me for two years for the code approved program, but they can extend one year for a master's degree. So the ones that are in the two-year uh, CODA program, we encourage them to write a paper. It might very well just be a review article, uh, you know, a systematic review and things like that, which are very important. And, but on our master's program, we, we, they have to produce an uh, independent research project. Some of those projects that we're doing are far more clinically oriented than they are bench, pro, bench, bench studies because we, we have a, at the University of Kentucky our neurobiologists working with some bench work that's important, but they're looking for the transitional movement into clinical stuff. Um, and what we've learned is uh, in, our, in our university, our, the patient population that I see, they have an average of about four years of pain before they arrive. So these are individuals who have, been, have had all kinds of therapies and are non-responders. Um, and so that's not necessarily the, uh, an appropriate group to do research on because these are, these are the, the non-responders in a sense. We, we'd, we'd like to be able to say that, do research on earlier situations and acute situations just to get a feel for that. Now, it's important to do the other two, and we've done studies on looking at patients with continuous neuropathic pain in the face and how they present. We have a psychology program, so we've got three clinical psychology residents and a psychologist that work there. We've got a battery of psychological testing that we can go back uh, over 6,000 patients, and we use those that database sometimes for research to determine who are the people with muscle pain compared to the who are the people with, with uh, neuropathic pain and other information I think is useful, but it's mostly database on people coming in. The problems we also face is if we say we're going to start, we are going to start a project right now looking at, at Botox injected into the gingival tissue in patients with continuous neuropathic pain. These patients have to be seen uh, regularly. So if we can't select these people that are, that are 400 miles away from our clinic, we've got to select the people locally. So that's a barrier to, to, to do some clinical research like that. Um, and time is always that way too. Uh, we're, we're, we're busy just like Dr. Abbott was just saying, it's just hard to get it all done, but our master students have to get it done. And, and we like to think there's some research that's coming out of that that has some meaning. So, so in regards to research, well, the University of Maryland was one of the multi uh, one of the centers of the multicenter study that was OPERA. 
and that, that focus in, in chronic TMD. And now we're going to hopefully do another round of opera if everything goes well. So we're very excited about that. So in regards to basic research, here in the Department of Neural and Pain Sciences, there are different research in addition to with uh, researchers. In, in addition, uh, uh, so we're, we're more that we're doing TMD also in the bench side that I think is very important. Uh, in addition to that, I, in one of, uh, so one of my interests is TMD and headache disorders. And we published, that will be a few years ago, uh, you know, if, if the calcitonin gene-related peptide was involved in TMD pathophysiology in a model of, uh, of trigeminal pain in mice, and why we chose CRP because it's, uh, it's the key molecule of migraine. And we were able to see, I think it's our, our study has been the first one to show a molecular link or a possible molecular link between TMD and headache. That will be CRP. So I think in regards, you know, research, there are things that, is, there are things that they are done thanks to the opera study, but also at the bench side. And in regards to education, so when I was at NYU and I had residents, as well as Dr. Rockeson, they, they spent a year with me, but that year they had, some of them they were able, with, if they had time to be a little bit immersed with me in the laboratory. And uh, in addition to TMD also, we, we were doing uh, stuff in regards to headache as well as trigeminal neuropathic pain. And here what I have been a year, year and a half, a little bit more, a year and a half at the University of Maryland. And, and the goal is to, hopefully we have a, a program here, a residency program here that we can offer to the orofacial pain train, uh, the postgraduate program to offer a master's and hopefully a PhD. Because I feel very lucky that I'm in this university because we have very brilliant uh, basic scientists that I think, you know, and as well as clinical scientists that we can push for more oropartial pain research and, of course, uh, TMD. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And we're in the discussion period now, so anyone can feel free to weigh in. But um, to continue that discussion, this is Corey Resnick again. Um, I, it seems like we're in this vicious cycle where the reimbursement and insurance coverage for TMD care is very challenging and very uh, variable between states. And unless that can be improved, it's going to be hard for patients to get access and hard to encourage providers to go into this field. Um, however, insurance companies have been burned before paying for things that were not evidence-based and so are probably reticent to um, start covering things again. So how do we break that cycle? What kind of um, real outcomes data is it going to take to prove to insurance companies that we're doing things better now and they should provide coverage? I'll throw my two cents in if, if I can right there. I think we're on the right track. We now have evidence-based graduate programs, which hopefully are going to produce dentists who understand the complexity of this pain things and provide the care that's necessary. Therefore, insurances hopefully gradually will start to appreciate that, that that actually can save them money instead of going to doing dentistry, which costs a lot of money, or surgery, which costs a lot of money, which is which is not necessarily in the best interest of the patients, but it's not in the best interest of the insurance companies either also. We also have some interesting times right now going on in our field with the idea of, quote, specialty. Okay, so, so it, there could be a time where oral facial pain is established and recognized as a specialty, which could help insurance companies say, okay, then we can separate the people who are well-trained from the ones that have less training, and maybe that's where we can focus our attention. And therefore, that, that, and, and eventually, I think, and this doesn't happen overnight, but eventually that will grow with the number of patients not, I'm sorry, a number of, of, of caretakers who can provide good evidence-based management of pain problems. So we're kind of in the right direction, but it's a slow process. Yeah, this is Tony Schwartz. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. So um, that's actually what my presentation is, is about, is the insurance companies. Um, and the one thing to, to consider and keep in the back of your mind is that, uh, quite honestly, there are more dentists practicing outdated uh, concepts than there are uh, who are up to date with the literature. 
So, and of course it takes insurance companies quite a while to catch up with that as well. So that's a big problem for us. Um, this is Francesca uh, Duamana. Um, so uh, at least two of you mentioned the need to adopt a biopsychosocial approach uh, to the management of patients with TMD. So my question is, wh what kind of communication, what's the state of communication training in uh, dental schools and what, what do you think would be the role of communications training in the management of patients with TMD? Well, I, I think... Well, well, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Go ahead, Doctor. Well, I was going to say I think I think it's critical from the standpoint is that a lot of the dentists are trained with very little, uh, they're very mechanical because that's what dentistry is about. They're learning margins and cry, frowns and impressions and all that. They, they have just they have Coda does have criteria that we have to teach dental students about the biopsychosocial issues and culture and things like that, which is very helpful. But these disorders often in TM disorders rely more, I think, on that than they do the mechanics. And that's not been emphasized that much. Um, I think when you get together and develop and, and, and we're developing more and more of these programs, we need to have a very, very strong precedence, presence of the biopsychosocial model. Because in our clinic, we have, like I said, a clinical psychologist and three psychology residents. These are individuals between masters and PhDs. And then we have also clerks that are finished with their PhDs and they'll, they'll also come in and supervise. They actually see our patients with us and they can teach our patients. Uh, Dr. Charlie Carlson, who is, who is, is relatively well known from a psychology standpoint in, in oral facial pain, he's put a whole protocol together on teaching patients how to quiet themselves down. I like to tell the patients, we want to learn, teach you to quiet yourself down from the inside out because we all work from the outside in. So we have things that are looking at autonomic nervous system, we're looking at heart rate variability. We're teaching people to keep the teeth apart, breathing techniques, diaphragmatic breathing, all those things are part of taking people in pain, especially chronic pain, and giving them an edge. I think that's, that's really important in our clinic. I think it's gonna be really important that dentists understand those concepts and know who to, they can't do that or don't want to do that. Who in their community can they find to help them with that? Thank you. Uh, uh, this, is, this is Sean Mackey. Just wanted to build on what was just said. And first of all, give my thanks to Dr. Okuson, Romero, Reyes, and Abbott for wonderful presentations. Corey, you um, went exactly where I, my first question was going to go, which was on the money which seems to drive everything. Um, when I was listening to the three speakers, clear need for education in dental schools and out in the community, clear need for people to engage with these patients. And yet the way our systems are built, they're based on monetary incentives. And until we crack that nut, it's gonna be a, a tough one. I'm glad to hear that there are improvements. Um, I was also struck with the overlap and listening to the speakers with the exactly the same language that we use in the uh, pain space. Everything that was said here, we discuss at a national level with trying to care for people with chronic pain. I guess that gets to uh, my question, which is brought up by the last uh, commenter, which is, you know, this issue of risk and treatment stratifying patient. Uh, it's clear that patients don't need, all the patients with TMD do not need comprehensive interdisciplinary care that's represented at um, the groups uh, that, that you three people have. So the question is how to better raise the level of education out in the community dentists so that they can in fact recognize when to refer and then um, recognizing that there are so few of these centers throughout the country and there's huge swaths of uh, uh, just vast wastelands, if you will, of medical care where people uh, can't get good care, you know, how to better uh, engage services, networks, uh, you know, referrals to get them at least that middle level of care before going to a comprehensive center such as yourself. I hope that question was clear. Uh, this I, is Dr. Oh. Go ahead, Marcella. Uh, well, <laughs> Yes, I would like in regard to that question. I think that my my opinion, the, one of the most important things that general dentists need to know is that this TMD should be treated with conserva conservative therapy. 
not irreversible procedures. It's what the evidence has pointed out, or several studies have shown out. Because, uh, as was mentioned, I think, by Dr. Abbott, the way that we're trained is in dentistry, we resolve pain with, with procedures, right? And I think that mentality needs to be installed in general dentistry. I'm not saying that all of them will do, but just to bring an awareness that PMD is a more medical problem, and we don't need to change the bike or do any equilibration or reversible procedure. I think that would be number one. How to, oscillate, uh, how to make sure that these patients get reset or screened properly? Well, I think we'll go back with education. Uh, that, that, that um, or at least, you know, we have, so the, the, something that I mentioned is that uh, we need to have better communication out to as a profession with us the primary care providers, ENTs, even sometimes themselves. When I have received referral is that the dentist sent to an ENT and the ENT say to the dentist that maybe it was a problem with the bite. So you see, a lot of things in education need to be changed. And I guess I will leave my comment to that. So, so with regard to the education, I get that. And there was a lot of discussion about dental school education. Mm -hmm. And that clearly has to be done. That's going to take, what is it, you know, <laughs> three to five years before you're going to start to see any changes even start to occur. And I think as was alluded to by another speaker, you've got large numbers of practicing docs out there, some of which are not keeping up to date with the uh, current best mm -hmm. practice. How to engage those docs throughout the country to increase awareness of this issue and to refer appropriately. Can I speak to that, this, uh, Dr. Abbott? Um, what we do here in our practice in our local areas is that you know, we make a uh, concerted effort to go out. Oh, we lost Dr. Abbott. We lost, we lost Dr. Abbott. It's like Dr. Abbott's cut out. All right, let, 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 me, let me come back in until Dr. Abbott comes back in. How's that? I think, I think what you said is it's, it's education, education. However, there, there's another part of this that we've got to realize, that there are still individuals out there who are doing procedures that are quite unnecessary, costing patients lots of money. We need to somehow be able to address some of the things that are very non-evidence-based and see if we can dampen down that, that field. At the same time, we're educate. It's part of all education. At the same time, educating those practitioners that have a problem come in, think about this. You know, I mean, there's some simple things. If that patient came to me holding the face and the jaws opening, closing, moving without increasing the pain, just get away from TMD. It's something else that they're experiencing. And that's a simple kind of a thing. It's too simple. It's not always that way, but it's not a bad, it's not a bad thing to, to start with. But I think education, is that continuing education? Sure. Is that, you know, is it in schools? Absolutely. You're right about changing curriculum. I mean, we've been through 28 years. We've gone with evidence. Well, you know, we've gone with strong support that we should make this a, a, a critical, a part of the dental curriculum and still can't get that. So, so that's kind of discouraging from that standpoint. But you're right. It, even if it would start happening today, it's three or four years of going like that. Um, uh, this okay. Is, I, this I, is I think Frank back. Keith, I, I wanted to ask about um, other allied health professionals. So there's, um, in terms of self-management and communication, um, obviously some barriers to having dentists do that. Are there commonly used other health professionals who do not require the extensive training, say, as, as psychologists and may be more readily in contact with patients, where uh, training of them uh, in these approaches um, might be expedient. Sure. Have, have, we have a physical therapist PhD program also, so we have three disciplines in the same room at the same time. And PT are... PT has always been trained, in my opinion, to do the very acute management, you know, acute injuries, surgery injuries, whatever. They're not really trained in chronic pain. But if we could get a group of physical therapists trained in chronic, chronic pain, which is what we're trying to do here, these individuals are wonderful individuals that can educate patients, teach them some of these self-aware self strategies, strategies um, and quiet things. This is, this is a real nice population that could be utilized with the right training in physical therapy. And then, and then there's, you know, there's other, there's psychologists, but 
this area of pain is not necessarily strong in the psychology area, um, but it's, I don't know, the physical therapy avenue might be a good one. Um, this is Margaret Hi, Kemper. Have you considered the role of nurse practitioners or physician assistant type providers? You know, we're, we're seeing that in Minnesota right now. Jim Frickton has developed a program where some types of nurse practitioners are involved specifically, that's a great question, specifically looking at what they can do to work with their patients to qu help them quite, quite uh, chronic pain. I think that's a very good suggestion. And thinking about the patients who have not just TMD, but also multiple overlapping pain conditions, um, nurse practitioners might be an ideal um, provider. Excellent question, because most of the patients I see have many multiple overriding conditions that makes it so much oh, yeah. more complicated to treat. Absolutely. Um, this is Francesca. Oh, sorry. This is Kathleen. Um, so let me ask you a question. How much training do dentists get in education on, uh, on the roles of other health professions? Like, do, how much do they get to know what physical therapy does if that's going to be a, if that could be a primary way to send them when they come in? Oh, yeah, okay, I'm to the physical therapist. But if they don't get enough training, and many medical schools don't get enough training, they don't know their role. So I'm wondering how much education is there. Is that something that needs to be beefed up or is it already being done very well? In, in medical complex like with Kentucky, we're seeing a push, and we have for the last 10 years, of interprofessional contact. So we have all kinds of courses and electives where students can rotate through other disciplines. Like in our clinic, we have, we have not only college students, but we have medical students, nursing students, pharmacology students, physical therapy students, all rotating and observing in the clinic. And then there's, there's courses where they actually can sit in classrooms and inter, inter, interreact, which I think is really helpful for these kinds of chronic pain conditions because it's so multi-professional. What, what about across the country? There's quite a few dental schools. Um, and there are some model schools that do it really well, and then there's others that I'm assuming don't. But what is the general dentist getting when he gets out? Me. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't. I, I, the, yeah, we're, I we're couldn't hear the question I either. I couldn't quite understand. It was breaking up. I couldn't get the oh, question. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, I understand that we have people from really great programs here. I'm wondering what the general dentist is getting across the country, not just at a single institution um, who's doing great interprofessional education. Not all places are necessarily doing that, are they? Or are they? Is that just become standard in all dental schools? I, I, my field is getting fairly standard in all medical complexes, so medical centers which have multiple, you know, dental schools, medical schools, whatever. I, I see the trend here, I have for the last 10, five years anyway, where I think more and more are doing that. Now, I don't, I'm not right in the mix of that, so I can't answer, you know, is this 50% of the medical centers or more? And it's still, it's still the big, you know, it's medical centers. It's not necessarily practice centers that I know about. Mm -hmm. I, I can, let me, uh, this is Dr. Abbott again. Um, the general dental population, as far as receiving in information, there's uh, there's courses at the university-based centers for training on TMD, but in the general population, they, they ha are sticking to the old um, unproven or disproven treatment mm -hmm. options that, that are out there. And, and that's being pushed by a variety of reasons. Maybe it's financial for the person uh, promoting it or maybe a product that's being promoted. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, we definitely see that those are the issues. Um, and, and the general dental population are getting these, uh, these quote unquote famous people that are pushing these ideas that have been proven, disproven 20, 30, 40 years ago. So we, we have to be aware that there's a lot of misinformation being uh, uh, propagated out there. I agree, Dr. Abbott, and I think you, you, you nailed it when you talked about finances. That's the driving force on that, and that's not fair to patient, patient care. We're, we're actually salmon uh, swimming upstream on this uh, issue. Yeah. Um, um, this is Francesca. 
Um, so um, uh, my expertise is in patients with medically unexplained symptoms. And, and one of the big problems there is over-testing in um, <laughs> um, necessary procedures, which I think is also a problem in TMD. So uh, an important principle in referring patients is to uh, have communications between, you know, the uh, primary provider and the uh, specialist so that they don't, because um, specialists tend to um, you know, do procedures and they, and when they see patients, that's what they do, whether or not it's indicated. And so um, communicating amongst the um, providers for the uh, patient is necessary, uh, is crucial. So um, I, I think um, Dr. Okinson, you um, mentioned uh, a need for um, collaboration uh, between um, me medicine and dentistry. Um, and I know that in your shop, essentially you have, it's multidisciplinary. And so it's easy to communicate with um, um, the different providers that might be involved in the care of the patient. I guess my question is, um, what, what were you thinking in terms of um, you know, communications between the different um, specialties. Um, what, ha what has been your experience and what do you think um, needs to be done um, um, uh, going forward and caring for patients with TMD? Sure. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm actually jointly, uh, jointly important in neurology and we have a part of a headache neurology clinic and the neurologists come to our clinics and rotate and some other things like that. What I've learned is when I first started involved, neurology wasn't, well, first of all, I'm going to say a blatant, blatant statement. Physicians are not aware of what dentists can do when it comes to pain. They know about tooth stuff, but they have no idea. So there's got to be some yes. on both sides where they can appreciate that, that, that this is something that can be some shared responsibilities. And since, since I've been working closely with most of the medical specialties, they've, they've embraced this. They're, seeing, they're sending patients, whatever. So there's a communication gap there. If I were in a practice in a city, uh, one of the things I would do as an oral facial pain person, I'd connect with the neurologist as one of specialties, the, the internist, you can go on and on, but the neurologist say, look, here's what we're doing and we're managing these things this way. And, and once you gain this, this common respect of what people do, all of a sudden we start to see patients who are getting a better care if they're getting into the right facility with the right care. Uh, this is Dr. Abbott. I, I'm in private practice and so I have a lot of... Uh, communication between the different providers uh, ones that we find out that we're we're connected with the most are ear, ear nose and throat uh, providers uh, that that's who I seem to be uh, get a majority of my referrals from um, how I communicate I, you know, I pick up the phone I give the provider a call and I get a list of, of all the providers that are in the patient's care and then communicate with them via a phone or I may send a letter to them but the, the ways that we do it, you know, we require people to get a referral. We require, require people to have different uh, communications, list all the things that they've had done previously so we don't overlap treatments because, you know, a lot of TMD doesn't require um, extensive uh, diagnostic um, images and stuff like that. So. We, it's really communication, asking the patient, what have you had done? What have you done? And it's more of a having a, a competent provider that will ask the questions instead of just look at what the patient has and try to treat it versus getting a history and physical that is part of, uh, part of the medical-based uh, treatment. I agree. This is Corey Rosen again. I hate to uh, break up this great discussion, but there will be some more time for more discussion later. Uh, but just to keep us on track time-wise and make sure everybody gets their chance to give their, their talks, I'd like to move on to our fourth speaker now. Uh, this is the beginning of our second panel. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Anthony Schwartz. Uh, he's an orofacial pain and TMD specialist who teaches at the University of Maryland and also has a private practice at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Dr. Schwartz has published numerous scientific articles, both uh, for research and clinical related articles, uh, and has served for 25 years on the written exam committee of the American Board of Orofacial Pain, for which he's a diplomat, and was also the president of that board uh, from 2010 to 2012, and then also from 2015 to this year. Uh, so I'd like to give Dr. Schwartz an opportunity to talk to us about uh, the insurance landscape. 
Okay, well, thank you. Um, can I go ahead and share the screen? Yes. There we go. Can you see? Uh, yes, perfect. We see you. Good. Okay, so I'm going to apologize first because a lot of what I have, I'm going to take the other side of the coin. A lot of what I have to present has been uh, discussed, but uh, perhaps I can still um, add something to the equation. Um, so the the topic was going to be why don't my why doesn't my insurance uh, cover any of my of my expenses? And here's the answer. The answer is actually T M J, and this is what it means. It it's been called the money joint uh, <laughs> very often, and uh, that's as has just been mentioned numerous times. That's one of the big problems. Um, so just to give a, a little bit of history, a very little bit. Um, in JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, uh, uh, you know, 67 years ago, there was an article that wrote that a vertex, occipital pain, uh, ear pain, tongue pain, pain about the nose and eyes were all associated with the temporomandibular joint uh, problems. So, of course, that's the invitation for dentistry to get in. And what we've seen and have been discussing all along are therapies accepted on the basis of uh, testimonials, clinical opinion, and blind faith uh, rather than science. And of course, uh, as Dr. Okerson mentioned uh, to start out with, after many years of all of these treatments and millions of dollars of patients' money, we found out that occlusion was actually very rarely the problem, but that's what we were trained to do. So what's next? Well, uh, continuing education courses, the University of Holiday Inn, we call it. Uh, these are the weekend courses, uh, some of which uh, promise uh, come to our course on Saturday and Sunday, and Monday morning by noon, you'll be able to bill a patient's medical, major medical for $5,000, you know, and that became very popular. And uh, one of the problems that we've been talking about is continuing education, is that there are actually more people going to some of these uh, um, off-label, so to speak, uh, CE programs than coming to the universities. And I think that's what we'll talk about next. There is a, uh, an organization that's referred to as the uh, Las Vegas Institute for Advanced Dental Studies. They have thousands of people, of dentists going through it. Um, whereas we only have hundreds, I think, uh, um, Jeff, uh, Dr. Okerson, in, in the 44 years, uh, how many uh, um, graduates do you have out of your program? It'll be in the hundreds, not the thousands. So. Um, so here they have on their website, what is TMJ, TMD and TMJ? And they've got a lot of symptoms, but what I have in red at the bottom is what really made my eyes pop out. It said it's hidden underneath these symptoms are generally a negative impact on blood flow to the brain, you know, as well as diminished airway and other nighttime sleep problems. So this is what uh, thousands of dentists are, are learning. Um, this Las Vegas Institute has a, a core curriculum of uh, these uh, six uh, cores, and they all end up with um, finalization of a physiologic rehab case, which means they're going to grind down all the teeth and make a new bite. Um, what you'll see here, um, this will make any dentist cringe. This course presents so much more than learning how to predictably prepare 28 to 32 teeth units in one appointment which is uh, really mind, uh, frightening. Um, so, but of course, when you have um, institutions like that that attract thousands of people, then you've got to have uh, companies uh, to sell their equipment to them. And uh, um, Myotronics is a company that started out, that, all of these are started out with well-intentioned. And even with this Las Vegas Institute, I guess if you're interested in cosmetics and veneers, that just might be the best place to go. I, I don't really know. But as far as uh, the TMD, uh, um, uh, curriculum there. It's not uh, evidence-based. So you have myotronics, and so they come with electrodiagnostics. We have a uh, jaw tracking. We have surface EMGs, which doesn't tell as much. Needle EMGs are very useful, and electrosonography. And uh, um, one of the problems with all of these is uh, this uh, refers to the electrosonography. Um, everybody's joint's going to sound somewhat different, and uh, they're trying to categorize different sounds. Well, there are millions of different sounds, and they're going to um, uh, teach treating patients on the basis of some of the sounds. 
And if you look at the bottom, it says uh, Wildman et al. found a prevalence of joint sounds in 16%, even amongst preschool children. Well, that's ridiculous <laughs> to, to consider that a, a patient population. Then the insurance companies, this is all why insurance companies are reluctant to pay. Um, there's something uh, referred to as applied kinesiology. And uh, um, here in red, it is not uncommon to have a sacroiliac pain treated at the site of the jaw joint. So, you know, if uh, an insurance company gets uh, claims for uh, TMJ problems, uh, they're wondering which group does this dentist belong to? Then there's the American Board of Craniofacial Pain, which has uh, hundreds uh, of uh, followers. Um, they recommend in their reading for their exam um, a, a book that has a, a discussion about what they call Nico lesions, which is not evidence-based and uh, most of us don't believe it even exists. So then of course the money, um, this fellow, this is a testimonial for somebody's course. And he said, uh, adding his system added a, a million dollars of production to his practice uh, within 12 months. And they talk about investment, they're not talking about uh, um, satisfied patients. So to, let's close up. So if you're controlling the purse strings of an insurance company, you, you would have a great many reasons to be suspicious of dentists uh, treating TMD. Additionally, and sadly, and this is what I was saying earlier, uh, more dentists are in the uh, LVI camp and the American Board of Craniofacial Pain camp uh, than they are in the evidence-based uh, uh, camp. And that's a real problem for us. And of course, with the insurance companies not uh, uh, accepting us, uh, makes the field undesirable to young dentists. So then we say what to do, and, and the answer is a specialty. So specialty certification, uh, of course, would, would tell the insurance carriers uh, who's qualified uh, in the evidence-based uh, training programs, and uh, hopefully they'll, they'll open up and allow that. And once uh, specialty is recognized, universities are going to have to uh, offer more formal programs. Um, as Dr. Okeson uh, mentioned, we've got about 12 uh, CODA approved programs in the country now. But uh, if it's recognized as a specialty, uh, we're going to have to have a lot more programs and we'll have a lot more graduates, um, hopefully, you know, in the not too distant future. And of course, uh, with that, we'll have uh, proper prescribing practices. It's a big social issue. Um, and physicians, dentists, the public will know to whom they can comfortably refer. So they're not going to be sending patients to, to a dentist and the patient comes back out with a, a $35,000 bill and their, their complaint is still intact. So, so we have the American Board of Orofacial Pain and Dr. Dr. Okasin's a past president, uh, as am I. We've got 25 years of uh, evidence-based psychometrically validated examinations. And even the Commission on Dental Accreditation, the CODA, which is a joint effort of the U.S. Department of Education and the ADA that declares the purpose of postgraduate uh, orofacial pain training is to prepare the graduates for our certification exam. And that'll do it. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Schwartz. I'm officially canceling my tickets to Las Vegas. <laughs> um, anybody have any you questions? Can make a lot, you can make a lot of money if you take those courses. <laughs> Um, anybody have any questions for Dr. Schwartz? Okay, um, then we'll move on to our last speaker and then we'll bring it back to everybody for uh, more discussion at the end. Um, so our final speaker is Dr. Kevin Huff. Uh, he is a private practice general dentist in Dover, Ohio and has been in practice for the last 23 years. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Orofacial Pain, and he's lectured throughout the United States and Canada and published many articles on topics uh, including temporomandibular disorders and orofacial pain disorders. Uh, so it'd be very interesting to hear uh, Dr. Huff's perspective on these issues. Go ahead, Dr. Huff. Okay, I'll try to share the screen here. I'm, I've got three screens, so bear with me just a second. And I'm not sure which one you're gonna see. So I think I'm gonna share this, this screen. All right, and that one looks good. Okay, you see your slides. Uh, there, does that look right? Yes, perfect. Okay, 
So thank you for the invitation. And uh, I bring a little bit of a different perspective. I've, I am a restorative dentist and have a specific interest in orofacial pain. And so um, my background, it comes from the Panky Institute, Spear Education, a lot of the continuing education backgrounds and was heavily trained in the way the teeth come together. But I've learned through experience and through studying that, that, that what we know to be evidence-based is, um, is again more, and, and I've always been more um, focused on lesser is better, lesser treatment is better or non-invasive treatment is best. However, one of the challenges that faces general dentists is that we ultimately end up having to put some sort of restoration in a tooth. So there is a gap difference between treating patients evidence-based for TMD issues and then what's next. In other words, yes, we don't treat TMD with bite issues, but the dentistry we do, we want to be predictable and not mess up what we're or what we've done or what someone else has done to treat the TMD. So that's an important um, aspect I just wanna bring up based on these discussions we've been having. So I practice in a little town called Dover, Ohio, which is a population of 15,000. We're right on the corner of Amish country. Um, and our nearest uh, specialist of any kind of any significance um, is about a half an hour away. So, um, I don't have the luxury of that team approach um, that I'd like to build. So I'll just preface my comments with that because I'm facing some challenges. Um, the main points I'd like to cover today, uh, you see on the screen there, but one of the biggest things is interprofessional relationships in rural communities um, with dentists, with doctors, with uh, nurse practitioners. And I will also preface my comments by saying that my wife is a pediatric nurse practitioner and I value what nurse practitioners do. However, they fall into the same group as the rest of us where there's lack of education. Um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about dentures and denture patients and TMD um, because that's an, a topic that's often overlooked. And today what's scary is that Dentists are being trained to place implants um, when their dentures are problematic to begin with. So we're jumping right to dental implants, which isn't really the topic of this discussion. But if you don't understand what dentures do and you have TMD issues, um, that can create a real problem. So, and then I'm going to touch again on the confusion we have of this TMD definition that uh, I think Dr. Okason talked about very well because there is a problem in the definition um, in what we talk about. So, and I'd like to, to introduce and uh, discuss a little bit the diagnostic criteria of temporomandibular disorders, which came out of the OPERA study um, as an evidence-based examination protocol and some of the challenges that exist where that's not being utilized. So, um, Let's talk a little bit about inter interprofessional relationships. And I'd like to do this based on my own personal experience in recent times, like within the past few weeks. Um, one of the common things that I see, and I get people that don't, aren't referred to me, but they just kind of drift in. Um, they drift in because they're my own patients of record or because somebody, I helped somebody that knew you know, that they had some problems and said, you ought to go see Dr. Huff. I really don't get very many referrals from physicians, um, but they do get this all the time. My doctor told me I have a TMJ and told me to go get a mouth guard. Okay, I'm going to address that real quickly. Mouth guards are a widget. They are um, something that dentists sell, okay, and, and every dentist thinks, and they're trained because mouth guards are our night guards, uh, once Dr. Abbott mentioned that word. Um, okay, mouth guards are to protect your mouth when you're playing sports. A night guard is to keep your, you know, from destroying your teeth at night. And a dental bite splint or an orthotic as we would prefer to call that is something that is used to actually affect the condition of health. Um, either to stabilize, reposition, or sometimes even to open airway. So 
the definition of what we're using is is totally confused. So when a doctor says, "I'll oh, just go get a bite splint," that I mean, I will tell you that if you put some type in a, if you go get a a cheap, inexpensive mouth guard that you can buy at Walmart or or whatever retail store, and put that in your mouth, that oftentimes will make things worse because it's nothing more than a chew toy that'll make things aggravate con certain conditions. So um, another one is I get migraines all the time. Um, I Migraines is a diagnosis that I hear all the time, um, but they're not usually migraines. The nurse practitioner gave me Topamax, which is a medication for migraine, but it really didn't do anything. And they've been on this for five years. So with no effect. And then my doctor told me to take a Maxalt that he prescribed, which is an abortive medication for um, migraines. But he didn't tell them when they should take it. And when they did take it, it really didn't stop the headache. But we'll just keep prescribing it because, well, after all, I get migraines because I have a migraine several times a week. Um, but there's not a clear diagnosis or a misdiagnosis. So. And then what this leads to is when they do come to a dentist who dentists are assumed to be, you know, basically mechanics of the teeth. We grind stuff out, we put stuff in and we fix teeth and everything has an immediate fix. Um, and then we start, his dentist starts talking to them about, you know, this isn't, this probably isn't a migraine. It doesn't fit the top. It doesn't fit the diagnostic criteria of a migraine. So, you know, we're, we're ch then challenged. So the failure to support our dental diagnosis in the medical community, um, a misunderstanding of fee structures and medical insurance coverage. Again, this is from the patients, this is from the medical community because, um, you know, when, I, when we charge for therapy for TMD disorders, we're, char we're not charging for a widget, although, in dentistry, the coding that we have is basically a code for a widget, a code for a bite splint or an orthotic appliance. But that, and that's kind of a global code and it's paid at a very low rate if it is paid. So again, we're not thought of as therapeutic professionals, we're thought of as salesmen of some sort. So, and then like Dr. Schwartz talked about, that's, uh, that's compounded by a lot of our CE um, programs that we have. And then we have an issue with licensure and prescription authority. Um, you're a dentist, why are you prescribing a medication for, or an anti-epileptic medication for instance, or why are you prescribing a long-term muscle relaxant medication? Um, you're a dentist, you should only be doing things with your teeth. Um, so, and then, and then many states don't allow us to advertise our training um, because we are, after all, only a general dentist. So um, this brings up, you know, some real problems. Here's just a couple of examples. Um, I had a 26-year-old patient who happened to be Amish um, with myalgia, which is muscle pain and chronic migraines without aura, who has a history of stroke. So this was my diagnosis, okay? Um, she had not been diagnosed with, them, with myalgia or with chronic migraines, but had been treated by several physicians and just told to take over-the-counter medications without realizing that she had a history of stroke at 26 years old. Um, so automatically, the first thing I do is I want to get the medical team on board. So I referred her to her physician um, who wasn't there. So she saw the nurse practitioner. The nurse practitioner then basically told her, oh, I had, I had requested um, that they would support with consideration of a low dose SNRI or tricyclic antidepressant, both of which are evidence-based medications to help manage the myalgia and the migraines. So, um, but the nurse practitioner saw the patient, didn't even read my report, looked at it, glanced and said, well, yeah, this is a dentist and I'm not going to prescribe. And then she said benzodiazepines. Now, neither one of those is a benzodiazepine. So 
and she told the patient, you have a, why would you pay you know, a couple thousand dollars for a bite splint? I had three bite splints. I ground through all three and they really didn't work. So why don't you just go to Walmart and get one of those soft mouth guards? Um, then she proceeded to call, or when I called the physician um, to speak to the physician after I got the patient, luckily the patient came back to me and asked me about it. The physician actually supported the nurse practitioner and said, well, yeah, you shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't have been, um, I shouldn't have been recommending those medications because I'm a dentist and they know their medical history. And I said, but I didn't recommend a benzodiazepine. Oh, well, let me read the report. And I never heard back. That's one case example. Another case example was a, I had a 32 year old patient with TMJ pain and headaches that was referred by another dentist to me. Um, she checked with her medical insurance first who told her that and to go to an ear, nose, and throat doctor because the ear, nose, and throat doctors are who should be treating the, um, this type of, of problem, the TMJ. And then the ENT told the patient he could treat her appropriately with ear surgery, so she never even came into my office. Um, so those are, I mean, these are real cases. And then as we go into denture patients um, and TMD, we also have a problem where, you know, a, a dentist or the physicians don't recognize, a lot of times they don't even recognize that patient wears dentures. These are two cases where patients had orofacial pain problems. Um, the, the picture there, and I think, can you see my cursor? I hope so. Um, this this uh, picture on the upper left is a cone beam CAT scan image of a patient who came to me because she was referred by a friend. A month ago, she had fallen and there was a significant change in her bite. She went and she had pain in her upper left jaw area. And she went to the uh, emergency room and they took standard x-rays. Um, not sure what they got. I couldn't even get a copy of the x-rays from the insurance company or, or from the hospital um, because I don't have privileges at the hospital. So they diagnosed her as, as having a muscle jaw pain problem, just muscle, and gave her some muscle relaxants and sent her on her merry way. Well, she came in and she was wearing dentures that actually had shifted in bite. And what you see here, this actually is her asymmetry that she had. And up here, there is a crack, a fracture in the condyle of the jaw that was totally missed and totally misdiagnosed. Now, at this point, this 80 some year old woman, in order to correct that, would require refracturing that jaw, repositioning, when it could have been managed entirely different if they had simply made the referral to a dentist that knew what they were doing. Um, as it turned out, we made, were able to make her a new denture that provided some support, but um, you know, it's, it's a secondary treatment. It's not the way it should have been treated. So then, um, and this other patient down here has been treated for migraine headaches for several years um, without any help. There wasn't any help. And the patient has been wearing the same denture for several years. And when the patient came in just to see about getting some new, set, new dentures, this is what we see. Normally, we don't take it. Um, a panoramic x-ray with the denture in place, but I did because I wanted to show how atypical this bite plane of the denture is. And when you have a, dent, a bite that's that far off, you will get muscular headaches and muscular problems. And so that's what she had. We made her a new denture and miraculously her headaches went away. So again, Physicians aren't looking, they're not trained very well to look at their prostheses either. Um, so this leads also to this confusion of TMD that we have. You know, a dogma that is taught, and quite frankly, it's supported by the literature, and I don't argue with it, is that TMD is not caused by occlusion. However, I just showed you a case with dentures where muscle pain 
is caused by a, an occlusal problem. Well, muscle pain or myalgia is in the catch-all term of TMD. Uh, temporomandibulars include myalgia in that. So, you know, when we say, the question we have to ask is what specifically are we talking about that when we're making a diagnosis of TMD and causes an etiology? And then, you know, when we look at this, as Dr. Okason pointed out, temporomandibular disorders include over 30 actual diagnoses. And those are bony, cartilaginous, and muscular in nature. So as long as we're talking about TMD and we're not breaking it down, we're just in a nebulous area. The, when somebody is referred here for TMD, I don't consider that really a good diagnosis. I want to know specifically what criteria or what are we actually diagnosing? Is it myalgia? Is it uh, disc displacement with reduction, any, anything that just a bundled term TMD. So how do we get that information? Well, it's already been done. And that is through the diagnostic criteria of temporary mandibular disorders, um, which gives a clear definition of how you diagnose it. There's beautiful, and this is freely available and able to be reproduced online. Um, that all comes from that opera study. And it's not utilized. I mean, this is an evidence-based diagnostic regimen that we can use. We've got continuing educations like Spear, Pankey, Kois Center, um, LVI. These are just a few, or a few but the big ones. And they're still not using the DCTMD for some reason. We've got major um, software companies like uh, uh, Rose Nearman has Dental Writer software, which is a big one for sleep treatment and things like that. It has a detailed muscle exam, and they're not using DCTMD guidelines. Um, so they're using other diagnostic techniques that are much more detailed, but not evidence-based. In other words, they're not necessarily accurate for what the diagnosis is. And the ADA really hasn't jumped on board and recommended the DCTMD, um, which I think, I think when we look at standards of care, that's something that's important. Um, and then the biggest thing is I mentioned it's online. It's very hard to get access to the DCTMD. You really need to look what you need to be well aware of what you're looking for. You can Google it, but then it's very convoluted. So that's one of the challenges that we have is needing, we need to make the DCTMD much more accessible so that we can use it for education. Um, so that's it. Um, I'm open to any questions. I'd like to thank you. Thank you. For patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Huff. Uh, does anyone have any questions directly for Dr. Huff before we open it up to the whole panel? Okay, well, great. Well, thank you very much to all five of our speakers. Uh, this was really enlightening for the committee. Um, it sounds like we uh, came back to several themes today, uh, starting out with uh, some gaps in education of dentists and other providers on TMD care, uh, lots of discussion about reimbursement uh, concerns, um, some discussion about how to enter into the TMD care pathways and some of the uh, erroneous uh, treatment providers uh, that exist and some ways that people go awry with their care um, and also some challenges in defining and properly describing uh, TMD. So a lot of uh, great topics covered. Um, and now with the remaining uh, 25 minutes or so, we'll open it up to the committee to ask questions of the panel and discuss. Corey, this is Kata. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Huff, since he's out there in the trenches, uh, the same issue that I raised uh, earlier about um, how do we get uh, dental practices or is there any way that they can take the time to participate in research related to TMD so that um, more of this evidence base could be gathered about what is going on and, and shouldn't or should be going on. 
I, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking what could be done to get more general dentists essentially involved in um, in learning about the evidence-based or in, are you asking specifically about research projects? Well, I think uh, we need, um, you know, practice-based research as well as um, sort of the more directly uh, basic science. And uh, I was wondering, uh, I understand that there are some practice-based uh, research networks, but not always um, the general dental practice. It's all voluntary. Well, it is. And we, you know, I participated in one. In fact, I'm a consultant on a project that's, uh, that's been completed and is in the publication stages right now, but where we looked at treating jaw pain in the population, you know, in the in the general, pra general practice population and we looked at, I forget how many different, we had through the, the National uh, Dental Practice Based Research Network. Part of the problem is in order to have high quality research, you know, we have this trend in dentistry now and uh, for better or worse, evidence-based care. And there is a total misunderstanding of what it means to be evidence-based dentistry, okay? We tend to think, well, evidence means if it's not supported by high-level Cochrane review type of, of uh, research project, multi-center, multi-investigators, then therefore it's poor research. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of the articles we read will say it's weak, there is weak evidence that this is successful, okay? Or this is, this is, there's weak evidence for this. What they don't, when, when people focus on evidence-based research, they don't realize that evidence-based dental care, according to the ADA, actually has three components. It has practice-based, uh, the practitioner's experience, the patient's educated desires for treatment, and the, what the preponderance of the literature says, which includes high-level research. However, it discounts things like case reports and you know uh, continuing education programs and things like that, which are lower level in research. So when we do that, we really make it hard for people to to understand that this just because there isn't research about this doesn't mean it doesn't work. And so that's a challenge. And so when we're looking at these practice based research projects, you know that the, the Clinicians that participate in these programs have to be trained. They have to go through uh, several hours worth of coursework on how to be a researcher before doing it. So I think it's important to do that level of research because that it means something. Um, but I don't know how to get just, you know, general, you know, other than surveys and things like that. The problem is, is that dentists really my experience is, because I was one of them, is that dentists really don't know what they don't know. Because, again, the field of TMD is very nebulous, and a lot of it is opinion, opinionated, and they're very strong opinions. And when we look at, when we have groups like the American Board of Orofacial Pain and the, um, that are looking to test people and with their knowledge. I mean, I went through that. I got to tell you, it's pretty rigorous. And that, and so when we have, um, when we have groups like this, people are, they're not, people aren't aware of that. They don't understand what that means. And then we have legislatures that are saying, okay, because this is not an ADA recognized specialty or because you didn't do a residency in this, you can't list yourself as a specialty. So we have an issue with, you know, in, um, in the political arena as well. So, and like uh, I think Dr. Okuson alluded to earlier that, you know, these, the purpose of these psychometric tests, or maybe it was Dr. Schwartz, the purpose of these tests are to, or the purpose of a residency is to prepare you to take these tests. But a lot of the states discount that test 
because you haven't had a residency. So it makes it very difficult. I don't know if I answered your question at all, but that's, that, that's kind of the challenge is we don't know what we don't know. So this is Corey. Um, a question uh, primarily for Drs. Huff and Schwartz, but certainly anyone can comment on this. Um, on the discussion that we started out with early in the panel about uh, educational um, barriers to teaching dentists how to manage TMD care well, um, then Dr. Schwartz showed us some uh, educational models that maybe are not helpful to our specialty. Um, but then Dr. Huff, it sounds like you have um, benefited from some of these models like the uh, Panky Institute, I know you mentioned, and the Spear Group. Um, so can you comment further on what educational models there are out there right now and how one might find one that's good versus one that's not so good and if this is the right way to be doing it with these for-profit sort of uh, educational institutes? Well, let me just make a couple of comments. I know my secretary is screaming at me to, to hurry up. <laughs> but um, one of the, perhaps the biggest problem we have is that some of these um, outside groups, and there are some very fine ones as well, but the, some of these groups, like the ones that I mentioned, um, advertise heavily, and they get large populations of dentists. And so one of the problems that I run up against when, when I'm being questioned uh, about this is when you have 30 or 40,000 dentists doing something, when you got about 175,000 in the country, are they changing the standard of care? Because they're learning and performing things that we don't teach in the dental schools, but it almost has a life of its own. That's, though these people are creating a different standard of care. And so what, one of the things we have to do is to get more continuing education in the dental schools. I agree. I agree with Tony completely. Um, you know, my yes, I benefited because I'm a general dentist, but I will tell you that Panky is one of the good ones, and but, and so is Spear. But I will tell you that, let's face it, and when you're talking about continuing education programs, um, money sells seats. So whatever's the sexiest thing, whatever the trend is, is what's going to sell seats and courses. So they are biased, and you know I. I am a faculty, visiting faculty member at Spear, um, but I will tell you that I am concerned about some of the things that they are teaching that are not evidence-based. And so, you know, there's, um, and trying to get them to change, the people that they have doing it have been doing it for 25, 30 years. And um, for instance, um, one of my colleagues is huge into taking MRIs on every patient. I think that's an, a huge financial burden that's, that there's just not evidence to support. It's not going to change the treatment plan in most cases. Um, and so I think that continuing education has to, or they're going to follow standards of care. Well, when there's not a standard of care, then like Dr. Schwartz said, then they're creating a standard of care because the definition of a standard of care is really, well, first of all, my, my other hat that I wear is risk management and the definite or well, who determines the standard of care is the jury in a trial. Okay. So that's who determines the standard of care for that particular situation. And it's based on expert testimony. And that expert is going in the, the definition is what would another dentist, another reasonable clinician in a similar situation do. So when you've got the masses being educated about certain things, I mean, I actually went to a course that I questioned. Um, I questioned and I said, okay, where's the evidence to support this? And the person said, well, you're going to, I mean, you're coming from XYZ Institute and you have the power of them behind you and what you say. That's scary. Um, because if it's not evidence-based, then that, again, is setting a false standard of care. So, yeah, I don't know. The answer to your question is, how do you know what's good and what's not out there in continuing education? 
Well, right now, I it's very hard unless it's a unless it's a uh, dental school program through one of these institutes, and that's I'd like to see funding for con and better continuing education programs from groups like Dr. Okeson's group and um, LSU has a great pro has a program of an externship program, and they're trying to get started with a uh, residency program. I mean, their program, I'd like to see better continuing education by orofacial pain programs that are open to the general dentist. Um, and again, it's got to be funded somehow. Okay, tough one. Thanks. Uh, who else has questions for the panel? Any other questions for the panel or any other comments from the panel? I'll comment just a little bit on what Kevin said about the panel, but uh, two weeks ago we had a, we have a one week continuing education program. It's 40 hours. It's every day for five days. I have nine speakers in our faculty. We had six, we had 67 individuals from 19 different states and 16 different countries that came to spend the entire week with us. Um, very rewarding to see all these people interested in pain issues and, and TMD issues like that. Uh, I wish we could do this every other week just to have the community. It, we can't, where's this out kind of, but, 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 but I think the, the academic settings, these programs do have an obligation to, to have programs where they can invite people in who aren't full time because most people can't be full time trained. They've got their practices, they've got family, they've got other obligations, but if they could come in to spend some time on a regular base, uh, I think that'd be really important to get us started or get us moving ahead. That's great. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, uh, again, thank you very much uh, for the panel. We appreciate uh, your taking the time out of your busy schedules to come speak to the committee. Um, we also applaud all your efforts to take excellent care of uh, complicated patients with temporal dental disorders. Uh, we've learned a lot from you and we'll take this back to our committee discussion. Thanks thank for the you. opportunity. Thank, thank you. For thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. That's thank you, everyone. Terrific. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.